Good evening. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is April 30th, 2001, and this evening we are pleased to have with us George Amadon. George, good evening. We're very happy to have you here. May I ask you how old you are? I'm 84, sir. 84, and what is your current address? Western Massachusetts. And, and your current marital status? I am married for the second time. And do you have children? I have a daughter and a son. My daughter lives in Marco Island, and my son lives in Houston, Texas. And I have seven grandchildren. I was just about to ask. Spread right all over the place, <laughs> and I never see them. <laughs> That's quite a way to go to see your, your children, <laughs> yes, isn't really it? Is. Where were you born, George? I was born in, in uh, Framingham, Massachusetts. Yeah, and were you raised there? No, I was, uh, until I was seven, I was raised in Hopkinton. And then after that, we came to uh, Framingham Center. And I lived there until I went to prep school and Lawrence Academy, and then college at William and Mary, Virginia. Then I was married and met a lovely lady from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we moved to California. And about after a year out there, the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred. So that was about... Tell us about your schooling, this prep school and... Uh, I went to Lawrence Academy. Yeah, and... And, the, and the, I was, I think I had a little dyslexia. I had little problems in high school. So I ended up a couple of years at Lawrence Academy. And then I went to William and Mary in Virginia. And uh, <clears throat> met my future wife there. And um, after a couple of years, we decided the world was in such an uproar that we would leave. And we did, and we were married and moved to California. Well, about what year was that, George? Well, what are we talking about, 1937, 40, 41? 41. Yeah. So the United States had gone to war uh, with the attack on Pearl Harbor. On Pearl Harbor. We were yeah. there when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Where were you? In uh, South Pasadena, California. Okay. On a Sunday afternoon. Nobody could quite believe it. Were, were you at, at school at that time? No, 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 no. We had you, left college. You graduated and, and all had been, of that. Well, yeah. I had not. We had not. We had, after two, two years, we left college and were married and moved to California where I was working in a frozen food plant as a uh, quality, in the quality control department. What was your draft status in 1941? What, 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 what happened to guys your age vis-a-vis uh, -vis the draft? Well, you signed up for the draft and uh, took your chances. And uh, I eventually enlisted in California, but uh, Framingham received credit for it, for some reason or other. Now, what occasioned your, your enlisting? Why did you well, do that? Well, after, after Pearl Harbor, Everybody went around to the various groups and air forces and marines and so forth to see the best um, outfit that you could apply to. And uh, I decided to try for the air force. And uh, why did you pick that one, George? I don't know. I, as a kid, I was always interested in airplanes and it took a few lessons in flying, or nothing important, but um, it sort of intrigued me with the uh, Spitfires and the Hawker Hurricanes and the activities and the ME-109s in the European theater. And so I applied as an aviation cadet and was given an examination and accepted as an aviation cadet. What was the date of this? Uh, oh, John, what are we talking about? 1990? It's 42, I think uh, you told me yeah, to join the service. Yeah. Yeah. Then I was sent to a classification base in uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I qualified for all three positions, the navigator, pilot, and um, bombardier. But I felt that if I took bombardiering, um, and got through that, then I could apply for pilot training in grade, and it might have been a little easier. So I applied for bombardier, and was one of the best students, but 
they finally decided to um, combine bombardering and navigation. So we were taking both at the same time. And I couldn't get very close enough with the navigation. Did you do this uh, as an individual, George, when you uh, joined the service? Yeah. Or were, were, were buddies with you that you'd gone to school? No, no. You were all by yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, because I was in California and I had grown yeah. up in New England. What course. did your wife think? You're taking off into the service here. Well, everyone was doing it. All of our friends were in the same. As a married boat. man, did you have to go into the service? Uh, sooner or later. Sooner or later, I would have been called. I was, what, 25, I guess. And sooner or later, I would have been called. But uh, everyone, all of my friends, were all doing the same thing. One of my friends ended up, ended up in the Marines, survived. <laughs> uh, tell, us, tell us more about your training in San Antonio. Well, it wasn't training, that was a classification the, base. The test that you took in order to, the, for the uh, government to say, gee, this guy would make a good navigator or a well, good bombardier. Well, uh, you did all sorts of things. You, of course, high, uh, extensive physical tests. And then you were placed in a tank and taken up to 30,000 feet and kept, kept up there for eight hours on an oxygen mask to see if you had any trouble with embolisms in your blood that might uh, cause uh, extreme pain. Is this tank the kind of thing submariners go in the, in, in the other direction? It's a pressure tank? I would suppose so, yes. They're in the water. This was just in, in low atmosphere, low pressure. And that you were taken to the equivalent of 30,000 feet? Uh, 30,000 feet for about, I would say, eight hours maybe or so. And that kind of thing. And then silly things like uh, they had a record on a record player with a with a metal dot in it on in the middle not in the middle but halfway between the middle and the edge and you had two devices that one that you cranked with your left hand and one with the right and you tried to keep contact with that thing as it was rotating now the point of that was the northern bomb site because the northern bomb site you had to use both hands, a fine and a gross correction. One was for the speed of the sight as it was on the target. And the second one, you controlled uh, the airplane uh, to the left or the right in a flat turn, not a curved turn, but in a flat turn with the Norden bomb sight. Is this what you were learning? Or That's what I was learning, yes. Yeah. But I washed out and oh, you did? I, couldn't, I couldn't cover the navigation. I couldn't come close enough. So I washed out and then they sent me to Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I went through armament school. And then the Central Fire Control for the B-29 school opened up. It was a secret affair. And you had to be checked out and uh, for security reasons. And we learned to handle the uh, gun sights and the gunnery equipment on the B-29s. And I ended up there as uh, central fire control. Was this a real B-29 or just a mock-up of the system? This was not. This was just a mock-up of the gunnery system in the building. Had you ever seen a B-29? I had never seen a B-29. Had I had never heard of a, B of a B-29? Oh, we heard of B-29s, but I'd never seen one. And in fact, is uh, I'd never flown up to that point. Well, no, I had in the bombardier training, the small planes. But uh, anyway, I graduated from that course and became a central fire control gunner and was assigned to a group which I joined and they didn't have any B-29s yet. All they had is B-17s. Was this at Lowry Field? No, this was, uh, no, this was not at Lowry. This, uh, I, I had taken this course at Lowry. I've forgotten where the air base was, uh, Kansas or somewhere. Um, can, can you tell us what it's like to be put into a system and the plane doesn't exist? You're in a building. Yeah, yeah. What, is it up to your imagination to think of the wings and the engines? Well, we didn't really care. We were the instruments that we were handling, that we were learning to handle. Describe the system. All right. Uh, it was a remote control turrets on a B-29. 
Uh, you had an upper forward turret with four 50 caliber machine guns. You had an upper aft turret with two caliber 50 machine guns in it. Underneath, you had a turret with two 50 calibers. The rear, underneath, you had a turret with two 50 calibers. The tail gunner had two 50 calibers and plastic blister just in front of the rear turret, which I handled. I could also handle the forward turret. I could handle them both at once with converging fire. And the right gunner and the left gunner, who were on the side in the plastic blisters, could handle the lower aft and the lower forward turrets collectively or individually. My position was to defend the uh, plane against enemy at fighter attacks. Did and you I literally? Did you literally look out and see the enemy attacks? And when we get to that a little later, or are you looking them at a, at a on a TV screen? Or no, no, no. I'm looking at through a plastic is, blister. This is real time. A plastic blister. Yeah. I had uh, an azimuth and a vertical. Uh, gyro on either sides of my head and a gun sight forward this way. I knew the diameter of the dimension of a, of a fighter plane for attacking us, so I would put that in, maybe 30 feet. And there were reticules that I controlled with my right hand that you, you controlled, you covered that target, okay, that gave you range. Okay, as you tracked the target, the amount of electricity used to precess the gyros on either side of your head was measured in a computer, and that gave lead to the guns. So first you put in your altitude, and then you put in the temperature. So everything was considered. Why the temperature? Well, because uh, a bullet's uh, trajectory will be cha will change with temperature. And the problem... Sorry, you are the colder it is. Yeah, so yes. That, yeah. The problem was, if you didn't... Every time you change your rate of track, you have a new problem to the computer. So you had to learn to track very, very smoothly. But as you're tracking something about the size of a fly, and it's flying in a pursuit curve, which is something like that, it's difficult to track. And in 37 some odd missions, I think I only got four fighters. I'm amazed that you hit anything. <laughs> so was I. I. Missing that <laughs> <system. laughs> <Really? laughs> well, this is, this is still hypothetical. You're, you're in training. Yes, sir. Uh, and then you got a, a group, but no airplanes. Yet. Well, then eventually, we got some time just flying in a B-17. Uh, Did you fly in combat in 17? No, 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 no. Eventually, we got You're our time. Flying around the states. Yes, yeah. flying around the states, just getting some air time, and then eventually, 29s were delivered to us, brand new B-29s, and of course, then we had to calibrate all the instruments on those, because everything is indicated, calibrated, and true. Uh, we went for. Ground speed would run down railroad tracks and get our ground speed and, and calibrate our, that particular instrument. There's a big difference, though, here. Uh, B-29s are pressurized planes. Yes, they're pressurized and heat. And the heated. 17s were not. That's right. What, what did you wear when you flew in this thing? Well, we wore heavy clothing because uh, we had to be prepared for the loss of pressure and heat if you were hit with any aircraft. Were you wearing the big puffy suits that he did in the 17th? Uh, not quite as much as that, no. No, we had uh, heavy jackets with fur, <coughs> fur collars, but not quite the heavy suits that the B-17s would have worn. This is in case you lost pressure. In case we lost pressure and temperature, which we did at one time. When the 29s were first uh, developed, they had problems with their engines. They had they had a right cyclone engines. And they burned up uh, with some. Well, they, they frequency. the air cool the uh, oil cooler. Um, we had a lot of fires with air, with the air coolers, and we finally got. Um, 
of engines from uh, Pratt & Whitney. And they, the Wright Cyclone were 18 cylinder and the Pratt & Whitney were 28. And they were great once we got those. But we did have problems with the early ones that just were underpowered and we had fires in the oil coolers. Mm -hmm. And I had some serious trouble. I understand too that uh, because of the pressurization, occasionally blisters would just blow out. Is that, did that ever happen to you? Well, uh, mine was uh, blown out because of black. Uh, we were over Tokyo at one time on a reconnaissance mission, and um, we, were on, we were very fortunate in um, dropping some bombs on a chemical plant and the flames were flying up. And these lights came on from the ground and it was light as day in that plane. As I often said, if I had a, a Lord's Prayer on the end of a pen, you could have read it. Yeah. If I'd had one, I would have read it. But actually the flak, of course, flak is uh, the shells, any aircraft shells that break up, the casing breaks up. And they're about the size of your finger and they spin. And one came right through my blister and went through my metal helmet and hit me. And my blister went and my leather helmet went and my flak helmet went and my throat microphone went. And uh, I got a concussion out of it and it got me out of there. But so it was not a function of the structure of the airplane? No, it was not. It was flak, okay. It was, it was flak and that, I got a, ended well up with explained. a purple heart. <laughs> uh, that, I won't say that it didn't happen. All righty. Uh, it rarely happened, but it did once in did a while. You, did you train extensively in the States in B-29s? Yes, we did, quite, quite a bit, yes. What kind of training? Uh, well, just what, long did you, flights. Did you drop bombs anywhere? And drop, we'd, at some, we drop, we'd go down and take some Nevada. long flights yeah. uh, down to the Caribbean and drop some bombs somewhere and then come back. But it was just long, long flights, really. And what we had you? some gunnery practice. Uh, the pl there would be a target plane that would tow a target. Yeah. And we'd fire at that. And you shot at that? And we shot at that. And we'd shot up some of the mountains and the continental divide. But um, uh, we tried to create a system so that we all know what we were doing and so we knew how to switch turrets. And now there was only a thousand rounds per gun in those turrets. And you couldn't get at the turrets as long as you were pressurized. Now, <clears throat> a caliber 50 machine gun fires 950 rounds a minute. So you had less than a minute to fire your guns during any mission. So you had to learn to shoot short so bursts. So you just short yeah. bursts. With yeah. the words. But you're firing. I fired a um, combination of six caliber 50s at one time. And if you're on a target, a short burst is going to how many? Down. How many men were in your crew? 11. Can you tell what the, their posts were? Yes, of course. You had your bombardier, you had your pilot and your co-pilot, you had an engineer and a navigator and the radio operator, radio operator forward. You came back through a tube that ran through the bomb bays and there was myself, central fire control at the top and the left gunner and the right gunner. Behind us was a radar operator, behind him was the tail gunner. Tell us literally how you got into your position. How I got in there? Yeah, physically, how did you get into the airplane and up into your seat on top? Well, okay, okay, there, there was a door, there was a door to the, to the, there's an aft door, and I got in through the door. Did you get up a ladder? Yes, it had to be, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it was a uh, good five feet tall, and you got up on the ladder and then I had to crawl up under this, under this chair that revolved 360 degrees. I could turn it by feet. Getting in was one thing, but getting out you had to be very careful that you didn't jump out holding the plane and touch the ground at the same time because the static electricity that had built up in that plane is going to go right through you. 
so he had to be I very careful. I hope they, they cautioned you about that. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> will learn very soon. Where are you now in time? Are you in 43, 40, what, Well, we've been talking about combat. We've been talking about a little of everything here. Well, really. let's, yeah. we haven't left the States yet, really. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Are you in, what year are you in? Well, um, well, in 40, 40, 44, I have, I've sort of forgotten the date. Okay, you, uh, you flew from the States to go overseas? Yes, we flew in our own. As a squadron. We what? had our own B-29. What squadron? Uh, 869th Bomb Squadron. The 497th Group. Okay. Yes, sir. There was 869th, 870th, and 871, and we had about oh less than 100 planes within our group. So we flew over uh, from Naples to you. Saipan, and Tokyo Rose uh, welcomed the captains of the planes by name. Now, Saipan was captured in June of 44, I believe. I think it was, yeah. And so you landed shortly thereafter that? Yeah, it was secured, okay. but uh, okay. there were 200 um, Japanese in caves in the hills, and the Marines had uh, put around um, barbed wire fencing, and nobody bothered them. They came down when we had an air raid, when the Japanese would attack us, and all the lights were out, they would come down for food and so forth. How many planes in your squadron? Well, uh, I was, the group had about a hundred planes. Uh, it's a group? The group. Okay. And you're landing on one of the islands that was freshly captured, and you're on a runway and you've got all your planes and your supporting equipment. You're ready to go to war. Yeah, yeah. And you're flying out of Saipan, and for the home islands of the Japanese, were these your initial targets? Well, uh, we took training targets. We had training. We went to truck. We bombed truck at all. Yeah. And uh, Iwo Jima, and Chichijima, Hahajima, uh, and training targets. And uh, ended up with a few Purple Hearts. Their anti aircraft was not that bad. You back up a second. You yeah. bombed Iwo Jima. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about seeing Iwo for the first time? It's an important island in your future. Yes, um, Rock Island. It's, uh, it was there. Did you have a specific target or? Just let them go. Well, we, there was an airfield there. We tried to hit that, but of course it was all covered by volcanic ash, and uh, bombs didn't do much, had much effect there. It just dissipated the volcanic ash. It was all black ash. Yeah. From what altitude were you bombing, George? Well, when we, when we started out in these various places, maybe 18,000 18, feet or so. Is it true that the B-29s, or the research of developing the B-29, is, was this the discovery of the jet stream, this new phenomenon? We did. Tell, we, tell we, us about that, would you? If we the, had a reconnaissance mission one uh, day. Everybody took um, turns in reconnaissance mission, and we were told to fly into Tokyo One, Tokyo Bay, and then rise up and go over the city from east to west. We'd always attacked it from west to east. So we attempted to do that, and we didn't get anywhere. We couldn't get anywhere. As we tried to gain altitude, we couldn't go forward. And there was something there, and we didn't know what it was. And we came back, we couldn't get over there, and we were accused of all sorts of things, of court martial and everything else. And they set up additional planes later, and they did find out that there was a jet stream there, which the Japanese had known about. They had known about? Yes, because they had sent over some balloons with uh, explosive on them, and they landed in 
Oregon or uh, Washington or somewhere, and some young boy was killed, and he found them on the ground and was opening them. So the Japanese knew it, but we did not. We did not know it until that time. Can you describe Saipan as an operating base and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more thunder and more noise and more big birds? What was it like? Well, of course, uh, Shirakanoa, the major town, it was a sugarcane area under the Japanese, and they even made some um, alcohol of some type there. And of course, it was all ruined by the shelling. The Japanese, the uh, Navy shelled the island uh, unmercifully, and everything was, was a wreck. And they even destroyed the generator, which was ridiculous. Later on, when they invaded the island, they blew up the generator, which we could have used. But uh, the, uh, the flight crews were all in Quonset huts, and the ground crews were all in tents, and the various groups were separated. And uh, there were, it was just a busy place. And the hard stands, of course, were in um, separate areas. But we had a lot of earthquakes there. Once in a while, you'd go down to the flight line, you'd see a B-29 hopping up and down. It was really? quite a surprise. But they're earthquake prone islands, they were, they were volcanic islands. But it was very hot there, very humid, terrible. And when it rained, they had tropical rain that came sideways, and it was just very unpleasant, but cooler then. What was your relationship to the island of Tinian? Did you have any communications or exchanges with them? No. no. The um, main thing I think of, think of Tinian, we had a, a theater built on with some 50-gallon drums and seats and things up on a hill, and we looked over Tinian, and occasionally we'd be watching movies, and they'd be taking off a road, and we'd see the planes taking off from Tinian. And I remember one time we had a big crash there that we saw. And she At this time, were you aware or had you ever heard of the 509th Composite Group? No. Did you have any rumors of this outfit that had trained in Utah in, in secret, more secret than anything you'd done? No. Any rumors about somebody carrying a big bomb? Nothing at all. No, there was no, no at all. In fact, after the bomb was dropped, they, don't, they didn't tell us it was atomic, they said this was a super bomb. We knew nothing about it at all. The only connection I had, a plane landed, a new plane landed on Saipan. And I went up to look at it. And it was strange. Instead of having two bomb bays, it just had one. And there were no uh, blisters for defense, just a, just a tail gun, as two caliber 50s and a tail gun. This was a 29, a regular This was a 29, but it only had one. The, the wings were attached to the fuselage. Where ours, normally, the wings were, went right through the fuselage, and you had a forward and an aft bomb bay. This had one big bomb bay. Well, I was looking around, and finally the MPs came tearing out and chased me away. Well, that was the Eleanor Gay. So this is part of the 509. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eleanor Gay, which they flew to Tinian and eventually Dropped the bomb from it. If you had been in the 8th Air Force, you had gone yeah. to Europe in 17s or 24s or yeah. 26s, 25s, you would have known that you had to serve 25 missions or 35, it was raised to 35. Yeah, yeah. And then you came home or, yeah. or did another tour. What understanding did you have? Well, they kept changing around, changing around. I How many I missions flew, did you have to fly? Well, I think I flew 30 some odd, but that included training missions. But, but actual combat missions, did you have any kind of an end of the tunnel for you? you yeah, knew? there was. Yeah. I've forgotten the exact number. Yeah, there was. I remember the last flight. Everybody in the B-29 changed positions. And I flew co-pilot occasionally as, as, a, as another position. And uh, on, the, on the last flight, I can remember, we flew, uh, I was flying co-pilot up to the time we got to combat. But, uh, the uh, number three 
Papa, hallelujah. Yep, and we thought, oh boy, yeah, <laughs> we got to make God, this or not. God. But we did, and we finally made it, and put us on a boat and sent us home. Let's, can you th remember your first flight uh, combat mission? Well, well, over Thanksgiving Day over Tokyo, we were the first mission to have an plane over. That would have been the end of 44 then. Yeah, yeah, Thanksgiving Day. And, uh, uh, a few fighters, very little uh, activity. Tell us about going into combat over the Japanese homelands, looking down, seeing Japan. What were your feelings about that? Was this a nighttime flight? No, this is a daytime, daytime flight. Tell us about seeing Japan. Most of our daytime, most of the missions before LeMay got there were against military targets in the daytime at probably 28,000. And uh, uh, it depends on where you got there, when you got there. If uh, you were lead, uh, you landed the fighters and then uh, they broke off and the anti aircraft would, come, would uh, commence. And then you were on the run, drop off your bombs. Get, to get out of there and get home. But uh, uh, it all depended on where you were. If you were late, you would see a lot of burning and explosions and so forth on the ground. But at night, it was more uh, spectacular. Uh, we got there one night late. Uh, we were just scheduled at a later time to arrive. And when we started dropping these firebombs, the idea, first of all, we dropped them indiscriminately. Then we learned, no, drop them in the windward side of them, drop them all together. If you got a fire going, drop your bombs there. And the wind would carry these firestorms right through the city. And Kirk, that's, that, that's very significant because of what you just said, you started out at realized that it wasn't working. He, he was put in command of all these groups. Um, we weren't hitting targets. There was no, no such thing as precision bombing. He said to get down to 10,000. And these are planes that weren't built for that. What, did, made that what did you guys that in the planes think about this? Well, You're now at 10,000 feet. Now what happened was, of course, it made the anti-aircraft much more effective. And not only that, but he took out all the ammunition on all the guns from the planes except the tail gunner. And to lighten the load. Everything was taken down and we'd go through it 6,000 feet or something like that in the middle of the night. But it was uh, quite a terrifying thing, but it wasn't pleasant. If you're a little late, uh, you came over and all you saw was squares burning where structures had been. <coughs> and they could smell wood burning and plaster burning and meat burning and it was a terrible experience. What did you guys talk about when you landed? This is this is Curtis Lemayas doing this to you. This this new hotshot general. About this. Well, we didn't like burning up we didn't care for burning up civilians. It was it was a terrible thing, but what could you do? I mean, you were, you were there, that was your job. And uh, you really didn't discuss it a whole lot. It bothered a lot of people. And, uh, uh, of course, he did the same thing in, in the 8th Air Force. He brought the altitude way down. He cut out evasive action. The losses were very high, very high. Previous to this, there had been a phrase, uh, Precision bombing. You'd pick out a square, a part of, say, Tokyo, and aim for it. And now you're going over it at night or uh, with all these fire bombs to burn the place down. Yeah, yeah. There were, there were bombs in clusters. There were tubes with napalm and plastic in them. And they were like a Roman candle. And these tubes would break up at about 1,500 feet. And these little individual tubes would scatter. But these fires couldn't be put out. 
with mm -hmm. fewer people on board to lighten the loads and carry more of these bombs. And less uh, gasoline. Were you kept on board as... I as, was, an know. observer, you know. But nothing I could do, I couldn't defend the plane or anything, but I was there as an observer and photographer. Were you a strike, taking strike photos? No, those are automatically done by the plane. As the bombs were dropped, the automatic camera in the plane would take, um, would follow the bombs down. And, uh, but that's one night when um, I was there when a 40, 40, meter, 40 millimeter shell kept coming along towards us. They explode at the top of the parabola, and I saw this coming to it from my right. It's the whole string of, look like firecrackers. And it finally hit our right aileron and flipped us over on our back. And we were spinning upside down. And the pilots, somehow or other, got that plane straightened out at 2,000 feet. But I tried to get out of there. I couldn't lift my hands. And the interphone went out, everything. Can you bail out of a B-29 or with, with all the complexity in your you're wired into the plane. Can you get out of the thing? Oh yeah, yeah. You can. Well, you can. You can, uh, the, from the back, you can get out through the main door. You just have to stand in line and jump. Uh, from the front, of course, the, they have to put down the nose wheel and get and out, go out through, through the, the wheel well. Yeah, yeah, and get down through there. You know, it wasn't as easy in the front as it was in the back. But there wasn't much point bailing out. Where are you? Over Japan. Well, over or Japan, the there wasn't any point at all. But over the water. Uh, most of our planes went in over the water. They were damaged on the target and went over the water. Um, we had a, you sat on a, on, a, on a boat, a little boat that you could blow up, and you had a long knife, and you had uh, canteen of water, a 45, had uh, regular shots for the 45, and some buckshot in the 45. So if you bailed out, you'd come down and you'd shoot, and just before they hit the water, you'd have to undo your straps because if you got in the water with those, you couldn't get out. And just before when your feet hit the water, you let the chute go and hope the heck it didn't come down on you. And then you hit a Mae West, you pull that, and then you pull... You better describe Mae West because somebody looking at this tape in 50 years... Oh, okay. A Mae West is a, just, a, just a vest yeah. uh, that uh, is flat until you pull these little tube with, the, with the, this gas in a little chamber and, and then, it expands it. And suddenly you're Mae West. And yeah. keeps you, and is a life preserver. And Excuse then you me, would, why is there buckshot in your 45? Uh, so that you could shoot birds. Oh, very clever. Yeah. Also, then you'd pull on whatever was there, where this boat was, and again you'd pull a little cord and there was a tank of gas there that blew this little boat up. But you had to get aboard before it was fully blown or you couldn't do it. Did, did you, you have to, ever have to do this, George? Pardon me? Did you ever have to do this? No, we did it in practice, but we never had to do it. Unfortunately, uh, we'd come back from missions and you'd be called out for search and rescue, and they'd refuel the plane and you'd take off. But if you flew high enough to see anything, the glitter on the water uh, would hide anything that was there. And if you, then you'd have to fly low enough and you couldn't cover much of an area. Not many people were saved that uh, bailed out. We passed over, or I passed over, something very important to you a, a minute ago. You said you were wounded at least once, twice? No, just once. And that, and that when that blister blew up. That's when, the, when, the when flak you got hit in the head? That yeah, was, it hit me yeah. here. When, that, uh, when the flak from the anti-aircraft. Were you able to, or have you seen other planes around you going down? Oh yes, in one raid I saw three B-29s go down, and one or two P-51s. You saw them go down all the time. Where did the P-51s come from? Iwo Jima. They were serving out of uh, Iwo. Prior to that they couldn't make it Saipan to Japan and back? No, they never tried. Uh, we only had two missions with P-51s, and as a lead uh, crew, we went up and talked with them before we went on this mission. We told them that their plane and the Tony, the Japanese plane, looked very similar. And, and two, don't dive out of the sun at us, because we can't tell who you are. 
and uh, they did escort us on one on two aids, but uh, they f cruised slower than we did, so they had to have a B-17 as their navigational plane. Mm -hmm. And they met us at the uh, uh, edge of the of Japan, and they dropped their fuel tanks, and we dropped our nose wheels, and everybody milled around and the right wing and left wing would get together with the leader and so forth and when the whole thing was milled around we got the attitude then we'd all go over the target at one time. Who dropped their nose wheel? Pardon me? Who dropped their nose wheel? Uh, the B-29s. All of the them? The flight leaders. Had okay, different that's colored, to identify the flight different leaders. Different colors, okay. nose wheels. <clears throat> yeah. And we were a flight leader so we had a colored nose wheel which we dropped and then our left and right uh, men would come in with them and we'd all wheel around together. And, uh, was there no navy under you between uh, Japan and Saipan? Later on. A later string on, of destroyers or something? Later on they had a sub, they had a couple of submarines on our flight line and they had um, rubber boats with uh, outboards and the word was to bail out over them. And they saved a lot of lives. Of course, Iwo Jima saved. Okay, the Iwo, that, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Uh, Iwo Jima was captured in February of '45, and shortly thereafter, you guys would would be able to land on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was trying to uh, find out before this interview how many Marines uh, it took to take Iwo, and uh, I think the figure was. Uh, 6,600, something like that. Un unbelievable losses. Were, were killed. Unbelievable were wounded. losses. Yeah. But didn't the capture of that island save more than that many air? Actually, men? actually, they say it did. We went, we crashed there twice. And uh, uh, tell us about crashing in a B-29 on Iwo Jima. Hmm? What had happened to you to cause you to crash? Well, we got our, got our engine, our number three engine hit, and it was pretty damaged up. We couldn't use it, and we couldn't have made it back to uh, Saipan. It would have used too much fuel, so we landed in there. I've forgotten what happened the second time, but uh, they saved, well, at one particular mission, I know that 20 B-29s landed there. They, were, they had been uh, damaged in combat. You saw some amazing things. When you go down on Iwo, and this is your plane and your crew, how do you get home? Well, it all depends. If they could fix you up, and, uh, uh, they, as far as we were concerned, they fixed our problem. You stayed there till they fixed the engine? Yeah, until they fixed the problem. Then you take problem. off and we go back to Saipan. Went back to Saipan, yeah. yeah. And take off again. Yeah. And take off again and take off again. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you tell us about waking up in the morning and knowing you're going to Japan that night for maybe the 20th, 30th time? Oh, it gets to be routine. Routine? You don't worry, you don't think about surviving and getting home. It's, it's bad luck. You just go along with the flow. I know one time uh, we were going out of the flight line in a, in a truck and we were seeing well, Omar Savinsky Sabar, whatever it is, today you will die for the Tsar. And our crew chief was with us, and it really bothered him. He thought that was terrible. <laughs> but you get to the point where life is, I don't know, not as important. From the Saipan end of it, um, you land, you're safe, you're home. True. Yeah. But there's guys behind you, and they're behind you maybe because you know, they've lost an engine or they're full of yeah, holes. Yeah, trouble, yeah. Did you stand around and watch them come in then? Well, we usually were sent out on uh, search and rescue, a lot of us. To go back they'd, to look for they'd them. They'd refuel the plane and send us out and try to find these people. What would you do if you found them? Well, just radio in is all we could do. The Navy would have to... As to where they are. Yeah, yeah. but we did have Dumbo planes that carried a life raft, and uh, there, we, there was one or two there that if there was someone ditched or someone in the water, uh, they could have done that. 
But the chances of picking anybody up on that, so much water. It took, yeah. You know, it took eight hours to get up there and seven hours back. You covered an awful lot of water. That's 15 hours. Yeah, per mission. And of course, then the winds on the surface are going to blow. You know where they went down, but and three hours later, they're miles away. Yeah. Was um, the B-29 a floatable plane? If it hit the water, uh, if, if I went down in a B-26, yeah. it sank like a rock. Yeah, well, it, it, no question. But do you guys have a few minutes to get out of that thing? No much. They usually break up just forward of the wing and after the wing. And the wing would continue to float, but both ends usually go down pretty fast. Of course, you're supposed to be able to drag your tail along and then, and then go under a little bit and come up. But yeah, that's a good that's theory. That's smooth water. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the jumbo, the Dumbos, the uh, Navy planes, what were they, PBYs, PP4Y2s? They saved a lot of PBY people. PBY was the Catalina. Uh, they saved a lot of people. They had ports on either side of the plane. Yeah. They, they were pretty yeah, good. And they could stay in the air forever. Yeah, yeah, and they could land in the water and, and uh, they helped. everybody helped. But in the first six months, we lost uh, a thousand men. In the first six months. The first, if you lived through the first 17 raids, you seemed to survive. I don't know why. But, uh, Did you lose the guys over Japan or were they shot up and they... Um, they didn't make it back. I would say most of the losses probably were in the water. They were shot up over Japan and some reason or other didn't have enough fuel or something and didn't make it and went into the water. Okay, how good was the fighter of, uh, cover against you? Excellent. The Japanese Tony, the Hien, was an excellent plane. Inline engine, similar to the 51, similar to the Spitfire, the Hawker Hurricane. All that inland type. They had twenty. They had uh, two thirty caliber machine guns through the propellers, and two uh, twenty millimeter cannons in the wings, and they were zeroed in at five hundred yards, and they'd fire the machine guns. And when they then when they began to hit, then they'd fire the cannon. And that cannon would make a nice little hole in either of the planes. You haven't mentioned zeros. Was was that not used? Uh, they were. They you? weren't high altitude. They were low, relatively low altitude. The zeros attacked us on the ground on, on Saipan. They flew down from um, Japan, refueled at Iwo, and they would hit us. That's before February of forty. Yeah, and then go yeah. back the same way. They burned up. Oh, nine V twenty nine had one attack. Were you ever attacked on Saipan? Well, yeah, we were attacked. We, we lost nine B-29s. They set them on fire. Did you see all this? Well, you see, you can't avoid it. No, they were, they were there. And the first thing, when we first got overseas, the second night we were there, the, fire, the alarm went off. And we had nowhere to go but um, down on the beach along the cliff. And we looked up, and there were searchlights. We were looking at a big Japanese float plane, a four-engine, big float plane. And they started to shell it with anti-aircraft shells. And they'd shell it, and the, the shells would break around, all around it, in a circle. And finally, they set it aflame. And this big flaming object just went very, very, veered very slowly, and then crashed into the water. And it bothered us. They were Japanese, but we were flyers too. Mm -hmm. That was our first experience in combat. That was the second night we were on Saipan. Welcome to Saipan. Welcome to Saipan. <laughs> I'd never heard before that Zeros had attacked Saipan. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't know they could make it from Iwo. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, they were pretty long. They were a good plane. They were an excellent plane, but no protection at all. No protection. There's only one Zero left flying. And that's in New Zealand. I found it on my computer. I got a picture of it. How many B-29s are left flying? Only one. And the Confederate Air Force has one. Oh, down in Texas? In Texas, yeah. 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 That's the only one left flying. Yeah. You spoke uh, before we began this interview. 
about a book written by a Japanese pilot. Could you tell us about that, please? Yes, yeah, sure. I've got a few notes here. Do you mind if I refer to them? I think I have your notes here. Okay, fine. Uh, on Tokyo, April 7th, 1945, uh, we had been brought down to 12,000 feet by LeMay, but it was not a uh, firebomb, it was a regular bombing mission, one of the last before the firebomb started. But we were brought down at, uh, for an aircraft, an anti-aircraft plant in Tokyo. We were first escorted by the P-51s from Iwo. There was 500 B-29s. The escort plane for the B-51s were a plane other than the B-29 due to the difference in cruising speed. Uh, we found flak now over 200 yards from any plane. Only two planes were not hit by flak in this mission. I saw two B-29s go down. One exploded, and the other is a falling leaf. It had been strafed, I guess, and it was just like that. We were attacked by 130 fighters. Most were Tonys. Reported five B-29s. They reported five. Yeah, we reported that five B-29s were shot down. I saw three P-51s go down. Sixty B-29s landed at Iwo with damage. I knocked down an Irving, which is a Japanese fighter, and lost contact with the navigational plane. I had been in correspondence with Captain Go Takita, a Tony Heian pilot in the 244th Air Branch, who was squadron commander and based at Hamamatsu. His Tony was one of the 130 that attacked us on this date. And he wrote a book, and it was interpreted for me. And in this book is what he said uh, concerning the same raid. At 5 o'clock in the morning, radio contact with Chikichima at Iwo gave notice that the B-29s were on the way. At 7.30, Captain Tahika was airborne with his group at around 800 meters, cruising towards Fuji-san, where they awaited the B-29s. At that time, the B-29s were recovering with their P reconnoitering with a P-51 escort. They had both flown up to Japan at a thousand feet altitude. The P-51s had followed their navigational plane and reaching the coast, formed the line and released their dual exterior fuel tanks, which glittered as they tumbled into the sea. The B-29 flight leaders lowered their variously colored nose wheels. Their wingmen joined them, and they all climbed to altitude and made landfall. <coughs> Pardon me. Captain Takita wondered why the B-29 was so slow in reaching Fuji when all the sorting out and claiming, climbing was taking place. He was also surprised that the planes were only flying around 12,000 feet when 20,000 feet and over had been the usual altitude flown with the When the group reached Fuji, he first noted the escorting P-51s. The Japanese had been expecting this for some time. The B-29s were called whales. <coughs> Excuse me, the P-51s were called sardines. It was now 9.30, and the captain was worried about low fuel. He saw something shining out of south of Fuji, reporting, this is Topu, we find whales, nine B-29s are coming. I decided to attack the one which was delayed a bit. I see they are coming, the P-51s. I waved to my wingman, Yamashita, and we flew onward at the big boy by my machine gun scope. I kept aiming at the third engine off the B-29. They were also shooting. I saw some yellow flashes, and I shouted, get it, seeing a streak of black, I, I shouted, I got it, seeing a streak of black smoke from the third engine. Due to the lack of fuel, we had to return to base. It was noon when I returned from a second attack. We killed four to five P-51s, and damaged four to five, but I lost my good friend Matsuyaka in this battle. Captain became a base commander and survived the war. His letter closed with more than 46 years have passed. I can still remember my friends that died at that time and many fights we fought clearly.
I thought that was very interesting. We were both on the same, same mission. And you saw it, you heard about it now from his perspective. Yeah, that from his perspective. Yeah, we said it was great. I've been trying to get in touch with him lately, but I haven't succeeded. I don't know whether he's passed or not. What's happened? There was a, a f Japanese fighter pilot called Subaru Sakati uh, who wrote a book called Samurai. Oh. And describes going up and shooting at you guys. Mm -hmm. And this, this is when we were down six, seven thousand feet, and he said it would fly up, and it was like flying up and seeing a house in the air. Yeah, yeah. And the startled faces of the Americans looking at them, yeah. surprised that they had coverage at those days. Toward the end of the war, they didn't have much. Yeah, yeah. Did you have eye contact with these people as they go by you? And no. I was not, well, no, 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 not that close. Not that close. Really, I contacted him with an Emmy 109 over Nagoya. What was that doing there? I don't know. Well, um, we had a mission over Nagoya, and I looked up, and there was a Emmy 109. A German fighter? Yeah. And it had the uh, Iron Cross on the side. And what was he lost? He was, I saw him. Coming towards us, he barrel rolled. He barrel rolled through the formation, uh -huh. and he came up, came up fairly close beside us, and I could see him. Oh, uh, he was showing off. Yeah, huh? there he was, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I reported to intelligence when I came back, and I checked further, and nobody ever had reported it again. But I gave a lecture in 1976. Old Ironsides. And I happen to mention in passing that all Ironsides was a unique piece of military hardware in it, as was the Spitfire, uh, the P-51, the ME-109. And in passing, I saw one over Nagoya. And I finished my lecture, and this gentleman came up. And he said, can I see you privately for a moment? And he took out his wallet, and he had all the same my service. And I thought, what in the world have I said? <laughs> I thought I was really in trouble. Well, he said that during the war, they had heard that Hitler had had three ME-109s disassembled and sent by submarine to Japan. But this was the first report that anybody had given them that one was used. Which I thought was interesting. Is this a, a show of uh, support for the Japanese? And show them how to attack a bomber formation, really, supposedly. But, um, is the uh, war winding down for you as, as you get along and uh, you've gotten so many missions, you've been hit in the head, you've seen a lot of guys die and um, you realize, I think, that you're winning the war because the Japanese cities are disappearing. Uh, how did the war end for you over there? Well, we first noticed, uh, well, we were sent on a particular reconnaissance mission <clears throat> with Colonel Morgan, the head of our squadron, as our pilot. Uh, after the Second Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Japanese Navy was defeated, and they retreated back to Japan. But uh, due to bad weather, uh, they lost them. They didn't know where they were. And we were sent out as a reconnaissance uh, plane to search the inland uh, sea of Kyushu. And we found them there. And they were uh, tied up to various islands and they were camouflaging them. And that certainly was a sign that, <coughs> that the fleet was out of action. And then you see streetcars that were stopped in, in, over Japan, in Japan. And then you saw um, a lot of uh, gas tanks that were flat on the ground because you'd see the shadow of, the, of their supports. A lot of things you saw through strike pictures of what you didn't see, obviously, yourself. But you were low enough to see that a streetcar is not running? Well, no, that was basically from strike pictures that were taken. Could you see people? No, no, no. And were you receiving any fire from the ground? Well, we always did. Any aircraft was either Fair or excellent or very good. It, it depended. One particular way, every plane but two were hit by anti-aircraft. What they'd usually do, they'd send up a spotter plane 
just out of range, mm -hmm. at your altitude, which they would uh, radio to the uh, anti-aircraft people, radio the altitude, so that uh, they were more effective. And of course, at lower range, at lower altitude, the uh, anti-aircraft was more effective. In other words, we came down with the fire rates and mm -hmm. so forth. Of course, one thing at night we had, each engine had superchargers, superchargers on it. And they were about that big, and they were red, flaming red. And the Japanese didn't have night fighters, but they'd see those, they'd see those and fire at them. That's a very good target, tar yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Japanese, a lot of them, would go after the number three engine of the B-29. I, I never could figure quite why, except that the generators usually on a number three, number two, and number three engines. And maybe they thought that's what was there. But a lot of them would come up from underneath and fire at that number three engine. This had captain, they, had, had they, captain did the same thing. Had they deduced this from uh, one of yours had fallen down uh, in Japan, and they took it apart and figured out this was, was a vulnerable some, spot. Yeah, probably. And Very clever. And, uh, they thought my spot was rather vulnerable too. But I was lucky. Didn't you feel kind of naked sitting up there in the top of the plane? Yeah, I don't know. You got a good view, but <laughs> you've got a bullseye <laughs> painted on you. Yeah, yeah but uh, the right gunner and the left gunner were down here. So we could communicate a bit. Uh, but, um, as long as the info worked, it was fine. Occasionally it went out, and that was a little awkward. I, think I asked you this question about an hour ago, but the war has moved forward since I asked it. Have you heard yet about this odd group on Tinny Ann that's all by itself, off on a corner of the field? No, no, not, nothing. Nothing from them yet? Not a thing, not a thing. Now, we were, we were on the way home on a, on a boat just off Hawaii, when the announcement came that a super bomb had been dropped on Japan. Ah, okay. okay. They didn't say that it was atomic. They said it was a super bomb. So you were rotated then before the war ended? Yes, sir. T why? Why, why, did you, why did they let you go? Well, we were rotated, we'd flown so many missions, and we were replaced. But you didn't fly home. You were on a boat. No, they sent us on a boat. Well, they needed all the planes they could <coughs> keep. To use. And were you going home? Yeah, oh, Back sure. to the States? Oh, yes, oh, sure, yeah. Your whole outfit? Well, not everybody, but everybody that flown the required number of missions. And which was what? Oh, I've sort of forgotten, I think it was 30 missions or so. Mm -hmm. and so many, we had so many training missions, and then we had combat missions. And yeah. I think th I flew about 34 missions, but that was training and combat. So I've forgotten just exactly us, what the number was. Tell us about that day. You're on a ship going back to the States and an announcement comes that uh, these bombs have been dropped. Well, the funny thing, we were, we got to Pearl Harbor about 6.30 and they closed the gates at 6 and they wouldn't let us in. But we were afraid that some Japanese submarine, submarine gates yeah. might not have heard about, well, then we heard that the bomb was dropped. And uh, Japanese, Japan, I guess it surrendered. It must have. Took a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, but we were there. And everybody on the island of Hawaii was having a ball. There were shooting guns, the lights were all on, everybody was drunk and running around and having a ball. Well, then, all night long we had a circle out there in the middle of the nothing was nothing, no beer or anything at all. And, the next morning, we came up and they'd opened the gates to Pearl Harbor, but there wasn't a soul there on the dock that could take our lines. So this ship had to, had to uh, lower a boat with a line on it, take it to the pier and put it on themselves. And we got out, we got off that boat and we wanted a party. Well, everybody was gone. Had you they were sleeping Pearl on the lawn. On the way over? Mm -hmm. You hadn't dropped off at Pearl Harbor on the way over, had you? This is the first you'd seen it? No, no, we'd started from on the way over, in fact. But everybody was out cold. They were all sleeping on the grass and 
all over the streets. They had parties all night. We were ready to party. There wasn't a single soul to party with us. <laughs> we were just chilling. That's the saddest thing. <laughs> <laughs> We stayed there a couple of, a week or so, I guess, and then got on another boat and went to San Francisco. What kind of, oh, Seattle, what kind Seattle. of ship were you on when you got pulled into Pearl? It was a Liberty ship, it was an awful thing. Way down, you slept way down in the hole, five bunks deep, single light bulb. It was on, ate two meals a day. Only time I ever stole food in my life. We were walking and standing in the line to go to the mess hall. <clears throat> there was a porthole that was open, and I saw a Filipino steward in a tray, two lamb chops, right? Put it right in front of that porthole. He left. <laughs> I reached in <laughs> and took him. So that's where they went. Later, the little bones in the sea. Well, of course, by the time they found out, I was way past that. The line had gone there. They blamed somebody else. <laughs> it was a great treat. Do you know the Navy is still looking for those two poor chaps? <laughs> <laughs> but before I came home, I was offered a field commission. I was a tech sergeant, uh, three, uh, three up and two down. And I was offered a field commission as a Central Fire Control Counter if I'd train the new recruits, the new replacements that came over. <clears throat> well, uh, my wife had had a daughter while I was overseas. And I was anxious to see her, and, and I thought, no, I turned it down. Well, a friend of mine accepted, and we both ended up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And you know, he got there before I did with his commission. <laughs> did he really? <laughs> they flew him home. I can't hold oh. my boat. <laughs> were you uh, discharged then, and were, that was the end of your... Uh yeah, I, flew, I flew, went to Minneapolis where my wife was staying and had a 45 day leave and then had to go back to California to be discharged and they flew me back to Minneapolis. That was it. Uh, and what, with what rank you were a tech sergeant? A tech sergeant. And, and what decorations did you have when you were uh, Well, I had the Distinguished Flying Corps, an air medal with three uh, clusters and the Purple Heart, four battle stars. What do you do with them? <laughs> well, well on Memorial Day. Can you give us a comment about this? I was very struck by the fact that you heard from a man who had a talk to you. Can you tell us what your opinion of, uh, of the Japanese fighting prowess was before you went up against them and what, and what looking back now, how good were they? Well, intelligence in my estimation in the services has been very poor since the Civil War. And when we first were going to attack Japan, we had very little information. We didn't know what type of any aircraft, guns they had, what caliber they were, what altitude they could reach. We didn't know what fighter craft, if any, could reach us. We had no information about anything. <clears throat> and we went over there and discovered the, there were several Japanese fighters that could attack us. We discovered the zero. Yeah. The zero was not, couldn't reach us, but uh, which we fairly knew. But uh, the Tony, the Heian, and the Irving, and the George, and the Frank, those planes could attack us and come out of, out of the sun at us. Two of them were twin-tailed uh, planes, like a uh, P-38. One of them had a turret between the tails, and you never worried about a fighter after he went past you. But after these guys went past, you began to see holes in your plane. The fellow in the back turret, they were spraying the whole formation as he left. So uh, that was quite a plane. But that didn't come too close, make, can't make very many serious attacks. The Tony was the major one, <coughs> the inline engine. That was good. It was an excellent plane. Excellent. 
Have you had occasion to talk with anybody in the military or with your family um, about this business of two bombs that were dropped uh, in, in August, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, about whether that was uh, necessary? No, I have good? a very strong opinion about that. I don't feel so. I don't think it was necessary at all. I think that uh, <clears throat> they could have picked an island uh, such as Aishima in Tokyo One, Tokyo Bay, which is very lightly populated, dropped it there. And it certainly would have uh, given the uh, emperor <clears throat> enough leeway to surrender. I don't, the Japanese couldn't have carried on a protracted war. As the things that I told you, the fleet was tied up, the streetcars weren't running, <coughs> there was no gas. Um, <coughs> I don't think it was necessary at all. And LeMay dropped the second one uh, without giving them time to consider the first one. And he wanted to drop more, and Truman stopped them. They wanted to continue dropping atomic bombs on Japan. And Truman stopped LeMay from doing it. That's my opinion. There are other opinions that might have saved American lives had we gone in there. There are two, two sides, I'm sure, of both of it, but I have a strong opinion one way. Did you know what was going on in uh, what I would, I guess, say the other chunks of the war, other parts of it? Did you follow what was going on in Okinawa? The, the sinking of the Yamato, things like that. Well, Did no. Did you guys uh, hear about that? <clears throat> no, other than the fact that, that <clears throat> it was a terrible, a terrible uh, battle. Okinawa was ferocious, and uh, they had a terrible time there. Uh, we came back from a reconnaissance mission. <clears throat> well, let's start back from there. In Tenepeg Harbor on Saipan, there was a gathering, a terrific gathering of the Navy, of Navy fleet. There were submarines, <clears throat> troop, troop carriers, uh, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, everything else. And the word went around that they were going to Evo. We weren't sure, but word went around that they were. <clears throat> and one morning we got up and they left. And shortly after that, we went on a single reconnaissance mission again. And on the way back, it was uh, cloud covered. And we were uh, near Iwo, and our radar, radar operator said, I can't understand this. I see two dots and two dots and two dots all going ahead, and then dots circling them. And so the captain said, well, let's get down and take a look. So we went down, it was the invasion of Iwo. And these were battleships, and they were shelling Iwo. And we turned into the uh, ship to shore, the shore to ship <coughs> uh, communication. And they said, well, you SOBs, you missed the target again. Raise your sights about 200 yards. So you were, you were then a, you looked an down eyewitness and, to the invasion of the And you'd look down and see the, see the ship. They were so busy down there, they didn't pay any attention to us. But we flew around there about a half an hour watching the invasion. And so, then came along home. That was a terrible thing, gee. That's the 4th Marine Division going ashore oh. there. You know now that belongs to Japan. You can't go there without a special uh, visa from Japan. And there's no commercial uh, transportation there. That's yet, pretty, pretty much sealed off now. And yet there's a big um, marine fuel um, graveyard there, cemetery. But it's isolated. You can't get to it. Hmm. You witnessed the, uh, it's, it's like having looked down at the Battle of Gettysburg. You <laughs> I know it, I know it really. 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 Can you tell us, uh, you've, you've, you've had quite an experience, can you think of anything in y your experience uh, flying as you did in, in, in over so long a time, one thing that stood out more than anything else that you think about? I can't even, anything in particular, so many things happened that um, seemed to just be a matter of course. <laughs> I don't know, the only time 
on that reconnaissance mission searching for the Japanese fleet, we flew 24, 23 hours in the air. That was a long time. <laughs> and we took the, picked, we went right back to uh, Guam, the headquarters of Guam, with the uh, pictures that we took of the, uh, of the fleet. Were you refueled to no. stay up that long? No, we had uh, tanks. You carried the, extra tanks. The tanks in the Bombay. And then once you drained the tank, you, dro you dropped the tank. Was there a memorable character who stands out in your recollections, some person that you think about more than any other? No, I think of um, Captain Archer, captain of our, <coughs> captain of our plane, <coughs> who had been an uh, instructor in four-engine flying before he joined our group. Uh, he was the uh, most cooperative fellow. and. Uh, the Air Force was, was not rank happy at all. And sometimes in training flights, we'd land in some place in Texas, and the officers would give us their hats, and we'd all go into the officers' club and have lunch. It was that kind of an operation. And the captain was really, really great. I can remember one, at one time the tail gunner said, Captain Wu, turn up, turn to the right a little bit, I can get this fellow. No question at all, he'd turn the plane. He'd work with you, you know. And, uh, he was a very good commander, <clears throat> but uh, very fair, very human, and cooperated. Good man. Sounds like a good, good man. man. Good man. Well, we brought you home happily, and you're reunited with your wife. <laughs> uh, did you join any reserve units after coming home? I did not. Home? No, I haven't joined. Any veterans organizations? No, I haven't like at that? all, really. I've made use of the VA. Did you uh, go to school, college, finish your uh, college? Well, I did, yes. I've, I haven't done it for a couple of years, but I've been going at night and uh, taking courses at Birmingham State and other places. But I haven't done it for quite a few years, really. When you came home, did you sit down, uh, not only with your wife, but members of your family or friends, and talk about what you'd been through, what you'd seen? Well. You know, I, people didn't talk as much then as they do now. Uh, we moved into Weston, and there was a, a lot of young people who moved in at the same time. We'd all been in various services and so forth. But I think we were more socially interested in social activities than sitting around discussing what we'd done. There was a little bit of it done, but not a lot. But I find that the older I get, the more people seem to be interested in, in, this, in these activities. And, uh, mm -hmm. I've been running the Memorial Day services in Weston for quite a while. And we have a parade and a speaker and this kind of thing. Why, why have you come forward here tonight well, to put this on tape? Was this important to you to do this? Well, sure. Sure, it's, I have remarried a younger lady, and she was barely around during the war. Doesn't. My wife died of cancer and after we'd been married 50 years. Oh, I'm sorry. So, a lady that I married a year or so ago, a little bit younger. And the water here is uh, being able to come to attention. When you had it, you, you're adding a humane and human dimension to it that nobody's ever going to get out of books. Yeah. This is a, another level of looking back in history. I, I have done some writing since I came out. I wrote a book on the Merrimack and the Monitor, and uh, <clears throat> it's in its sixth printing, and that's been very good for me. The Monitor won, you know. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm writing one now on the uh, Penobscot expedition. I do some writing. I write some poetry. Good for you. But, uh, I work three days a week. I'm running nursing job fairs all over the country. Well, in, in your life now, in your 80s, uh, how important to you was serving in the military? Well, I, I take pride in it. I take pride in it. Do you feel it affected your life? Not adversely. 
Not a, I had, I gave up that time away from my wife, but that was it. But it was something that everybody was doing, and it was that uh, I've been lucky. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky. <coughs> what did you think then, uh, back in '42, and what did you think now about the war that you served in? Well, back then, I talked with my wife before I left, and I said I thought the chances of returning were about 50-50. And the way it turned out, it was about the losses of our original squadron. It was about 50 percent. Of course, we kept getting replacements, but I'm talking about the, from the beginning to the end, the losses were about, <coughs> losses were about 50 percent, and that's what I figured when I went over. Do you feel that there was, uh, if you look back as to when you came home in 45, 46, and the way you were received by your cohorts and the people in, in, around you, and the, the way that other men has, have been received from Korea and Vietnam, do you see a distinction there? Oh, yes, definitely, yes. I was treated royally, uh, absolutely by everyone. Everyone was just, I was treated, treated royally. And, but my son, who served in, in uh, Vietnam, fortunately he came out in one piece, um, they, were, they were not treated well at all. Not well at all. But I think he's handled it well. He doesn't have any feelings or grudges. Where does he live now? Oh, he's the he one lives in, in Houston, Texas. 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 You know. I was going to say send him over. <laughs> You'd like to. I would like to have him here. Yeah, yeah. George, is there anything, uh, any one thought or one incident that uh, perhaps we haven't talked about tonight that you'd like to make part of this tape? No, I just hope there's never another war. Wars do not solve problems. Is there anything else I haven't asked you that you'd like to discuss tonight? No, I don't think so. I think we've covered things pretty well. Yeah, we thank you so and much I, for coming and I being thank, with I us tonight. I thank you. It was a great privilege. <laughs>